How many of you started landscape photography without a solid knowledge about composition rules? You end up in the front of this beautiful landscape and you start thinking about what composition should apply here and there and you don't realize that it's already too late. There is a quote by Edward Weston that says, Consulting the rules of composition before taking a photograph is like consulting the laws of gravity before going for a walk. So in other words, you have to know these things really well. And you know it so well that it becomes an instinct. And for this to happen, you have to know it, you have to understand it, and you have to practice it. And there's no way around this. I know from my own experience that when I was a beginner photographer, I didn't know too much about composition rules. In fact, the only rule that I knew and applied was, was the rule of thirds. And that was it. Later on, I started to study and learn about different rules of composition and that opened a whole new world of possibilities for me. Composition means that you kind of arrange the natural elements in such a way that that photo speaks about a subject. It should all converge the attention of the viewer towards a subject. And it's no point having a subject without a composition or a composition that points to nothing or worse, a composition that points to a subject and the actual point of interest is another one. Now, Anne Slazens had a quote that says, there's nothing worse than a sharp image of a fuzzy concept. And that was completely true. That is still completely true. Having a clear point of focus and a good composition to support it are the key elements of a really good photo. If you find yourself in front of a landscape and you find that you don't know what rules or composition you should use in that particular situation, it's because you're lacking experience. We all can learn the rule of composition. I mean, it's not a difficult thing, but to know how to apply those rules to a practical situation and understand what you're doing and doing it by instinct, that's a whole different story and it takes practice and it takes a lot of time. In this video, I'll present to you nine composition rules. Nine. Nine composition rules for landscape photography. And for each rule, I will show you examples of my own photos and I will explain what is happening inside those photos. Now, each rule is very important, so don't skip through the video or through the explanations because you might miss something. And if you take a look at all the information that I have for you in this video, I can guarantee that by the end of this video, you'll have a different understanding on the rules of compositions regarding landscape photography, and you have a different vision about how you can apply them in your landscape photography. We'll start with breaking the rule of thirds. I think it's very interesting and in, we're starting in a good way. The rule of thirds is the most spread out rule that everybody knows about. But the first rule is how to break the rule of thirds. There are situations when you can do that. And this photo, and uh, I will show you the, another, uh, another few photos, are perfect examples when you can do this. So this is a perfectly symmetrical element. And because of that, because it sits in a forest and everything looks the same, you have symmetry from all sides. Usually when you have symmetry, that is the moment when you can break the rule of thirds. Very, very simple. Let's move to the, another photo. Again, this is uh, a breaking on the rule of thirds on the horizontal. So we're having the subject straight on the middle. But in terms of vertical, it sits at the bottom of the photo and because of that this it creates a very powerful shape a smaller one first and then a bigger one but it it made sense to frame it like this because it 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 complements the the small cottage complements the mountain in the background and also the mountain complements the cottage it's like the cottage it's a duplicate of the mountain in the background. Again, breaking the rule of thirds. This is completely breaking the rule of thirds. When you have reflections, it can also work. So we're having a middle line over here and a middle line over here. So And the subject is placed right in the middle and it works. So remember when you have symmetry uh, or you have reflections, this can work. Here, for example, on the horizontal, 
we have a placement of the subject um, exactly in the, in the respect with the rule of thirds, but we also have its reflection. So in a way we have two points of interest and for that reason I'm maintaining the horizon line which is the middle of the or the shore of this lake right in the middle of the photo. Over here I'm photographing Seceda uh, in the Dolomites and it's a simple triangular shape at the base of the photo and I really like the clouds above so I thought why not having the point of the mountain right in the middle of the photo pointing straight up and having lots of sky into the shot. I think this works really good and because the mountain is not to one of the sides of the photo I think the photo works best and I think the, um, the sky is better emphasized. Here's a sunrise at Lake Bled in Slovenia. So uh, I'm breaking the rule of thirds on the horizontal. Okay, because in terms of vertical, I'm respecting the rule of thirds. You can break the rule of thirds completely and go completely minimalist and have it and have your subject straight in the middle. But for this case, I um, use it on this uh, area of the photo. Now again, I'm, uh, I'm uh, breaking the rule of thirds only on the uh, horizontal. Now in terms of editing, as you can see, this is a photo that it's not edited, uh, hence the vignetting from the filter that I'm using. When I would edit this photo, I would probably clone this uh, small tree over here just to have a, a, much, a much more powerful composition. This is an island uh, in Norway and it was a really huge storm and I think this worked really really well. In terms of vertical I'm still respecting the rule of thirds but the reason for, for which I'm respecting it is because I'm having um, this area of darkness, light and then darkness and I just wanted to have equality in, in uh, between these two areas. I wanted water to be equal to this top area and then have a little bit of light over here. In terms of horizontal I break uh, I broke the rule of thirds. I'm having the mountain placed right in the middle of the shot but in terms of vertical that is the reason for which I made it like this. If the sky would have been clear then I could have uh, I could have break it all the way and have it even on vertical, have the island placed in the middle. Now let's move to the second rule of composition and that is the S shape. The S shape it's kind of like a leading line but it has in a way the shape of the letter S. So this is a very simple and very powerful way to move through the photo and the reason for that is because it kind of takes you through the entire photo. You see we're starting somewhere around here and we're going into this side and then we're turning and we're going to this side and then we're turning, we're turning again and then we reach the subject. So it's a, uh, a very powerful leaning like the S sharp and the more curvier it is the more it takes you through the entire photo. It's the same thing over here. So we are just taking a journey through the photo. Again, so roads as you can see are very well for this. Uh, shores um, and uh, trails in the forest. These are the kind of things that are just going in curves like this and looks like S shapes. And sometimes, for example, over here I had to emphasize the S shape to kind of have it more, um, more visible to, to your eye. And now this is the mother of S shapes. And as you can see, the S shape doesn't have to be a simple S. We can have all sorts of uh, rows that go like, like this. And you see there is a progression 
so it starts small and then it goes bigger and bigger and bigger and this way you follow the road uh, and you go through the photo and it's again this this is a simplified version but again it starts small and then it widens and because of that I think your attention is placed over here now I uh, for the sunrise I waited to have light only here and then the road um, took your attention towards this small chalet over here that was complemented by the brightness and the light of the sunrise in the forest i told you the trails go like this and like this it's it's a natural way for trails to go inside the forest so inside a forest it's a very uh, common place to find this composition uh, the S shape and in this photo I'm using the boulder here the boulder here the trees all these are kind of like stopping elements elements that help you go through the photo again a road and because the leaves are to its side I'm using the painting in the middle of the road to guide your attention now let's move to the third rule of composition leading lines now leading lines um, why they can be different from the S shape is because they can go in different direction and they don't necessarily look like a uh, the letter S they can have all sorts of shapes the idea is that you have lines and you go from point to point and the, in the end you reach something over and sometimes this line can be a very simple line over here we have this line that takes you here and a very thin one that goes through here and the subject is Seched over here in uh, smoke and fog here we kind of have like a, an S shape but it's not a complete S shape and so for that reason it takes you here and then it takes you here again as you notice I really like compositions that are starting to one side of the photo and they move to another side of the photo and then you end up into uh, the point of focus or the subject over here we have a leading line formed by the ridge of the mountain that takes you to the moon over here or you have the wires of the cable railway this, these are the leading lines this is just the mountain is just a counterpoint of this uh, small uh, telegondola over here the leading lines are multiple we have the mountain in the, the, the mountain the road in the background but we also have these lines and everything points um, over here to the chapel we start here we go up and we return to the point so we start to the left we go to the right and then we reach this place over here so you need to understand this kind of flow and when you position yourself inside nature you just have to position in a way that the leading line is taking the viewer through the entire photo and not um, not only through through a portion of uh, the photo now the leading line doesn't have to be really a line I uh, for example here I position myself in such way and I did a long exposure so the movement of the clouds form the leading line so you can use different elements to uh, suggest that over here I'm using this pillar as a leading line there are all sorts of geometry happening but this pillar is the main line that takes you to um, uh, this area over here again a leading line it starts in this so you have lots of elements over here and because the uh, leading line finally turns over here you can overlook that the line doesn't go something like this it goes only in this area and then it turns again we can have very simple leading lines these are compositions that can be seen in paintings a lot we have a small or a simple ridge of, the, of a hill or over here we have a simple line and the subject placed 
on that line. Here the leading line is formed by the clouds and also by the ridge of the hill but the most powerful line that has also the most powerful the, the biggest contrast are the clouds. Now uh, rule number four the good way to use diagonals. Diagonals are in a way lines that um, cross in uh, the entire surface of the photo and there's a good way there and there's a bad way to use this and I'll show you both variations over here we have this kind of like this this is a line that crosses the entire frame why it works it works this photo works from two reasons first of all this is a progression and because of that you kind of you kind of see it like this in a way but secondly it's a, it's a divider between, because diagonals always will divide uh, the space of the photo. But the way this works in this photo, and you'll see in, in other photos, this darker area, it's a support for what is happening over here. When the photo is divided and both areas uh, look kind of like the same, but one has all the interest and the other has none, that is a bad way to use diagonals. Again, a good way to use a strong diagonal in the shot. This is a support for this. There are still things happening over here, but the main thing is over here. Again, a really strong diagonal over here. And it's just a simple uh, way to offer support and create depth in the photo. And these are all sorts of diagonals and it's a progression as you can see here ha you have lots of detail less detail and so on in a way this is also a diagonal it's not completely diagonal but it's a com it's all it's also a diagonal but um, we have the subject here but there's also something happening in the lower part if if this would have had nothing in it over here so this is for example a wrong way to use diagonals because both these areas have white and snow nothing happens over here and over here we have the house if we would have had another element let's say somewhere around here then it would have worked because this would have been a counterpoint of this but we don't another wrong use we have the fence and the fence separates the photo into two areas this small tree over here it's not enough to be a counterpoint for the bigger trees over here again we're separating the area this area over here it's useless so it looks odd it looks strange you don't have a reason for that Rule number five, intersection of power lines. There's a rule in painting that says whenever you have important lines in the, in lines in the photo, whenever you, ha uh, you have this, you take a look at the intersection and you take that intersection, you make a vertical and on that vertical you place the point of interest. Now this is a very powerful composition rule especially when you're photographing in the mountains and you're a landscape photographer and the, the reason for that is because this intersection draws the eye very very strongly. So again we have powerful lines and on that vertical we place the subject. Very a very powerful composition rule. So you have you find two powerful lines you see the intersection and on that intersection you take a look and you place the focus point the eye will automatically go to this intersection the eye is drawn to this intersection and even here where we have leading lines so again we have this line and this line and almost close to this line we have the subject 
Here we have rule number six, where the subject should be separated and the separation or the point of interest should be separated. The separation has to happen because of light, because of color, because of other elements. So something has to make the subject pop. And in this case is the light. Again, we have light that it's uh, framed by areas of darkness. Whenever you can create this, you'll have a powerful image with a dramatic look. We have a tension over here. The light falls only on the top of these pine trees and we have all these other areas in darkness. The light of the sunrise catches only marmolada over here in the background and the rest is in darkness. So this pushes your attention towards the mountain. Again, Peace Boye over here in the distance. And you have this, um, this moment when the subject is separated so well because of, of the light. And this happens in the early hours of the morning when the sun is just rising. Sometimes it happens in the sunset, but usually sunrises are best to capture this. Again, you see all this area in darkness and the subject is so clearly separated because of the light. Cinque Torre over here, again in Dolomites. This is a sunset photo. So I waited until the sun went down. We have this beautiful shadow over here. I also used my gradient filter to the top and you have the, atten the attention concentrated over here on the, uh, on the mountain. Again, and over here we have multiple things. We have first we have a diagonal that offers depth and supports the rest, and then we have these two powerful lines. So we have an intersection of three lines, and over here we place the subject. And not only that, but the subject is in light, and all the other elements are in darkness. So very very clearly. We also have, when, when you see the face of a mountain, you can have these type of images that I think they look really, really good, these type of images. Well, over here we have separation because of color. Everything else is green and it looks the way it looks and this large tree, it's all yellow and it pops. It, it separates so well from the rest. Again, we have light only on this element over here. So the point of focus is very well presented. Now, number seven, get away from the margins of the photo. Now, this means that whenever you have your subject or your point of interest, like in this case, this small house, this is way too close to this margin over here. Also, another problem with this photo is that you have a counter point over here and this tries to grab some attention. You would have to clone this out and this house you, you would have to move it a little bit to the more to uh, to the right. Again over here so the composition takes you kind of like this and this where is the point of focus it's too close to the edge. Um, whenever this happens you have a big area of contrast so in a way the entire photo becomes irrelevant because your attention is only over here. It's the same case with this one over here. Number eight, framing the point of interest. Now this is the moment when you create a, a frame inside the frame and for example when I'm inside the forest I'm using trees as, as guardians and I'm paying close attention to how the trees are positioned uh, alongside my trail. Again, I'm framing with darkness. So I'm, I'm having this area of light and I'm framing with darkness and, uh, and the trees. Over here, I'm okay, I'm seeing the light that is shining over here but I, and the darkness in this area, but I also needed an element uh, to my right. If, if this element over here would not be present, then your attention would, would escape because you have light in this uh, area. A most powerful way to frame uh, an element. So we have kind of like these two lines and then we have 
that when these two are stop elements they don't let the viewer escape and just look over there over here I'm framing with clouds so whenever you see peaks coming out of the clouds just uh, take a photo of that it looks interesting here I'm, I'm again in the Dolomites and I'm seeing these two rocks they look I mean they look like a gate and with this I framed the peak in the background I'm the only minus of this photo is that this peak is not something like this it, it if it was bigger then it would have looked a lot interesting when I'm photographing inside towns I'm using archways to frame the subject it looks really really well I'm using line of trees to frame the the chapel in the distance I'm using darkness to frame light this is happening not only inside uh, buildings but as you can see over here uh, outside of the building so whenever I'm inside towns I'm trying to find darkness and whenever I see the darkness is ending that is the place where I want to be I want to be over there and to capture the transition from that place from darkness to, to light here I'm framing with these um, elements again I'm framing with darkness and because of that everything looks uh, looks that good I'm framing with buildings the tower in the distance so let's move to rule number nine which is negative space and negative space works really really well to emphasize the size or the proportion or uh, the true uh, I don't know a, uh, a mystical feeling of of that subject um, it's also a minimalist uh, approach to your photo over here we have this group of trees there are you know we are in Tuscany we're photographing sunrise and we have this image uh, then we can move over here we have lots of sky and the reason was to capture proportion you see a very small house compared to a really big cloud and the, the size of the sky emphasizes that um, again I'm using all the, the sky above to give it room now you have a, a, a small house in all that uh, space this is a very minimalist approach we had fog and here we have a really small tree inside all this uh, snow a simple fence leading to a tree and uh, the fog that it's so thick it creates the negative space around it again a small house and a small fence and this heavy fog that creates a surreal feeling to the image now negative space can also be something like this where uh, you have a forest everything kind of looks like uh, the same and now you have a feeling of where the small church is placed you have a uh, I don't know it gives you it connects you to to the place now you're starting to think how this small church is over there and you you notice also a small grave over here so it becomes a story it becomes interesting to see uh, to see this and you you have a way to understand where this is happening if you want to further improve your knowledge about landscape photography knowledge about settings composition editing and knowledge in general that regards landscape photography I designed an online mentoring program that is specially for you now this is a one-on-one -on -one program and it lasts 30 days now, if you're interested, you can check out the link in the description of this video, click on it, see the details, and hope to see you for one of these online mentoring programs. And I'm pretty sure, and I'm 100% confident that by the end of those 30 days, I would change the way you look and approach your landscape photography. Thanks for watching, and bye-bye.